Well, thank you to the Maxwell Institute for inviting me to speak um, at this event. And I have to say, I fully endorse and support um, shows like this because of the opportunities that it creates for students. And I really love, okay, I'm going to be technically challenged for a second. Um, Just a second. We actually didn't do a run through. So do I press? Oh, here we go. Okay. It wasn't that hard. All right. <laughs> um, so as you can see, the topic of my talk is let God prevail in your art. But I wanted to first talk about um, the the purpose of of this Book of Mormon contest. And one of the, one of the things that jumped out to me was... Um, that this is designed to to and encourage is designed to um, encourage students to research and to deepen their testimony in this case the Book of Mormon and I think that's a wonderful wonderful opportunity and gives students an opportunity to to flex their creative wings as well as their spiritual wings at the same time. And so um, I just really love that about the purpose of this exhibition and also to engage the Book of Mormon in a different way. Um, I also had a chance to look at the, um, at the entries and I was very impressed with the different approaches. And I love that we're ex expanding uh, and broadening our vernacular in the church and seeing different styles of art. And also to those of you who have... Um, maybe address some of the underrepresented stories and um, characters in the Book of Mormon. I applaud that. We need those stories just as much as we need the heroic ones. So thank you for that. And I hope that whether you got in this show or not, uh, and whether or not you got a prize or not, I, I hope that you can feel that you can come away a winner because of the process that you might have gone through to to enter a competition like this because what it demands of you spiritually and it demands of you to study it demands of you to pray perhaps fast and maybe to shed some blood sweat and tears I don't know what you went through but um, sometimes that can happen and I really do appreciate that and so I hope that no matter what you can feel that you've come away with something so why is sacred art so important um, is gospel art relevant in your life um, is it relevant in our secular culture? Um, do we just see sacred art as illustration in a magazine? I really hope that we can see that there are higher purposes in our life. Certainly there is illustration that, um, that can um, illustrate a gospel story, but I have a personal belief that art ha can have a higher value in our lives. Um, I want you to imagine Paris without Notre Dame or St. Peter's in Rome without um, Michelangelo's Pietà or um, all of the sculptures, the Sistine Chapel ceiling and all of its architectural wonders. I want you to imagine Florence without the Duomo or Mexico without Chichen Itza or Teotihuacan or its cathedral in Mexico or Cambodia. Cambodia without Angkor Wat or um, the Bayan Temple in Cambodia or Greece without the Acropolis. Now, all of these places have religious significance. And can you imagine these places without them? And uh, imagine if Karl Bloch had never painted his eight altarpieces for the Friedrichsburg Palace. So I think you get the idea. I think we do put a value in our, in our society on these sacred places and sacred art. And I think we can do so in our own culture here. But really, you don't have to take my word for it. Um, Elder Ballard um, has said, great art touches the soul in unique and uncommon ways. Divinely inspired art speaks in the language of eternity and teaches things to the heart that the eyes and the ears can never understand 
Aristotle said the aim of art is to represent art, not the outward appearance of things, but their inward signif significance. And you can look up this talk. This is such a great talk by Elder Ballard. It's filling the world with goodness and truth. And that was given, I believe, in 1996, 1997. I also put out a survey to my followers on Instagram. I asked them a couple things. I asked them, have you ever connected with a piece of sacred art? And is sacred art relevant to you and why? And asked them if they would be willing to share some sacred experiences, if they were willing. So, this is actually a quote from my daughter. Ginger Egbert, who happens to be in the back, she said, when I view sacred art, artwork, such as individuals portrayed with a savior, I put myself in that individual's shoes and evaluate my own current relationship with the savior. Would I greet Jesus the same way as that individual? What would it be like to embrace the savior, to lay down my burdens, to accept his peace? And I love that because it can be a personal experience. I really love this quote by Merritt Welker, just another follower like you or me. Art bypasses the analytical brain and can go straight to our heart. I think that's the power of artwork and sacred art in particular. The intellectual impact is important, but the emotional impact and the spiritual impact are stronger. There have been times where I felt like it saved me when I was living in a very, in very difficult circumstances. And I love this as well. If we cannot see ourselves in the divine, we have no vision. As Proverbs say, with no vision, we perish. Sacred art matters, especially for me as a woman to see Heavenly Mother, and so I have included the image here, I think that, uh, of our Heavenly Parents. Here is another um, story. Oops. And this one um, is a very personal one, so I have with withheld her name. I was in college in Boston, I was dealing with the aftermath of sexual abuse. Outside the bishop's office hung Morgan Westling's The Promise. Every time I would see that painting, whenever I was seeking out my bishop, struggling with my worth, I would go up to that waiting area and I could feel myself in the artwork. In a very real sense, that was me, the savior held onto and embraced and protected. I didn't need a spiritual experience feeling the savior. I had a painting as proof. And here is that painting. And this is the last one that um, my um, friends have shared. Not a lot of religious art is geared towards a Polynesian audience. So for these girls to see the painting, A Royal Heritage by Esther Kandari, really moved them. I feel like children especially need that visual representation representation of Christ to understand and connect with him. And so Esther um, allowed me to share this with you. And I am a firm believer that representation is absolutely important so people can feel themselves as part of the story of salvation. And this is another quote by Elder Ballard. God's purpose for the artist is to inspire, to give it, oh, sorry, in the, quest, in the quest to achieve greatness in artistic pursuits, we should always seek first to achieve God's purposes. And that's kind of a hard one because um, out in the world, the artist is really the author of their own moral universe. And it's absolutely um, antithetical to that whole way of thought out in the art world in, in our Latter-day Saint culture, we embrace um, inviting the Holy Ghost to create with us. And that was something novel for me to learn when I had first joined the church as a brand new art student back in the 80s. Um, so I, I think that is, um, that's something that 
first of all, we need to recognize that we can do. Sometimes we don't realize that we can, we can ask for guidance from Heavenly Father. Otherwise, it, it can become a very selfish experience. It can very easily become a very selfish experience. Seeking Christ in every thought and following him when all our heart requires that we align our mind and desires with his. And that's Elder Suarez giving that quote. And of course, you all have heard this, my dear brothers and sisters, this is a big one. As you choose to let God prevail in your lives, you will experience for yourself that God is a God of miracles. Well, can I submit this? Can I substitute a word in there? Can I, I'm going to substitute your lives with art. So it would say, my dear brothers and sisters, as you choose to let God prevail in your art, you will experience for yourself that, a God, that our God is a God of miracles. And I can testify to this. I've had my own personal experiences, many personal experiences of miracles in my life, tender mercies from the Lord, and he's helped me. And now I'm not saying that in seeking the Lord that you have to paint Christ in all of your images or paint outwardly religious art. I don't think that's, that's for everybody, but I think that God can help direct you in your trajectory as an artist. And I think that's really important to always seek guidance so, because you don't want to put your ladder on the wrong wall and, and find that you've climbed up too far that it's really hard to turn around and make a change. I will share with you um, um, a most recent experience for the past few months. I've been preparing for a studio tour with my daughter, Ginger Doll Egbert. Egbert. What we do every year is open up our studio um, and show our newest works of art and works in progress. And we um, invite the public in. And this is sort of a community event with other artists who do the same thing. And months prior to this, um, leading up to it though, I had been feeling that I needed to make a change in my life. I, I felt like I needed to deepen my own conversion because I've been a little lax about my scripture study very easy to do and it, it can happen to everybody um and we can kind of do this thing sometimes we're doing great sometimes we're not but I've been feeling like I really needed to deepen my conversion and so I was a little bit more diligent about reading my scriptures and then I started switching out some of the things I would do for entertainment because I am um I'm a huge nerd and I love science fiction and fantasy audiobooks, but I would sort of consume them like there was no tomorrow. And I realized that that was probably distracting me away from what I needed to do. And those things aren't bad in and of itself, but it became bad for me because it was very consumptive. And, um, and so I started changing the patterns of my own behavior and Filling that void with good things and like conference talks, I re-listened to Jesus the Christ and would study the prophets. And I, um, I also started listening to podcasts that would help me with my Come Follow Me study. And as I did this, I really did feel like my testimony shone brighter. Um, and I started to understand the scriptures more and I could hear the whisper, whisperings of the Holy Ghost more in my life and as I was getting ready for the studio tour and I had a backlog of projects I got COVID and all these things were working against me and so I asked the Lord for help and I knew that he would help me I knew because I had faith I had faith because of what I was um uh, the images that I were uh, that I was painting I was painting the life of Christ and so it really did become a loaves and fishes moment because up to two weeks before the art show, I, had, I still had five blank canvases and, and I still managed to fill them. I have this story here and I actually have um, Eliza here was with a group of friends. Where are you, Eliza? Are you, there you are. 
and I'm 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 going to put her on the spot for a little bit. But Eliza and her two friends, Anna and Z, came to my studio tour, and all all of you are student. Um, are you in our student as well? No, you're humanity. Are you humanities? Okay, yeah, declaring major. Um, well, anyway, we have um, Eliza here and Anna and Z who go to UVU. And Anna happened to stand in front of this painting. And she stopped and uh, the, pa the painting is called On the Shores of Gennesaret. And I actually happened to be um, there um, in the Holy Land and I used some of my references. But Anna stopped here and she she paused and she just stared at the painting and she said, I feel my testimony coming back uh, or something to that effect. Am I quoting her right? Is that what she said? And then she later um, messaged me on Instagram and she said, the experience of going to your studio and seeing your work literally changed my heart. The peace of Christ in, in the front room spoke to me because I literally felt like he was looking at me and seeing me. The facial expressions and the poses of Christ in your work humanize him and make him seem like someone I could actually see walking on the street. That was one of the few times in my life when I can completely and honestly testify that I felt the Savior near me. I know I was pretty floored by, by that statement. And now I also need to clarify something because I don't think this had much to do with my own personal skill. Um, I, in fact, it is not even my favorite painting in the show. <laughs> but um, it really had everything to do with where she was at spiritually and the Holy Ghost speaking to her. And the Holy Ghost using the instrumentality of the artwork to speak to her. And that's how the Lord works um, with sacred art. Um, he uses our art to convey a message. Sometimes we didn't know we intended. Um, and definitely not by my design. Um, but the Lord works in mysterious ways. But this story doesn't end there. Because I met, as I mentioned, there were three students. And um, they went to the upper gallery. Again, I am sorry. I don't have images of that. But... Um, I could tell that they were all moved. And because I have a really soft spot, soft spot for college students, um, and I could tell that they really love the art, I, I let them each pick out a print. And, and these are the prints that they decided to take, and I asked them to share with me what it was about those pieces that... Um, what it was uh, about them that touched them. And Z chose anointing for burial. Now Z, um, he chose this, uh, he's somehow connected with Mary of Bethany. Many believe that this is Mary of Bethany. Um, as a woman and as a marginalized character. Because women, uh, women weren't known to um, to uh, you know, sit at synagogue and learn like the men did. And um, he treated her with respect and recognized her sacred act of anointing him for burial. And he shared with me that as somebody from the queer community, um, he related to her as a marginalized character because he's had a very difficult time before his mission and he's come back, he's been back for two months and really trying to stay strong, but it has been difficult. And so he has, he felt seen by Jesus, just like Jesus saw Mary. And I thought that was uh, beautiful how he shared that. Um, and Eliza, Eliza picked this piece and I'm sorry, Adam. Eliza picked this piece because, and she gave me permission to share this, that she had been having difficulty reaching out to Jesus, and it had been some time. But 
But at that moment, she had recommitted herself to reaching out to Jesus more. I know it's really hard sometimes that we're told to do this and we're told to do that and the natural man in us will, will want to balk at that and not want to be told what to do. But she told me that she chose this and she chose to reach out to Jesus. And I think that's what Jesus wants us all to do is to choose to follow him and to choose to reach out. And just like the woman with the issue of blood, And then the last one, oops, the last one is um, Anna, who had uh, loved that other painting, the morning on, or the shore, uh, on the shores of Gennesaret. Um, she chose this one. Um, and this one, of course, is the, the miracle of the Feast of Cana, where Christ turns water into wine. And why I chose to paint this I think resonated with her and it was inspired by a talk um, given by Elder Clayton and um, he said, we demonstrate our determination to serve the Lord faith faithfully um, by faithfully engaging in daily acts of devotion And the Lord promises to direct our paths, but for him to do that, we have to walk trusting that he knows the way because he is the way. We must fill our own water pots to the brim. We must trust and follow him in our lives. This is the part. Our lives, like water into wine, are transformed. So I know that was a mouthful, but basically it's those daily acts of devotion which fill our water pots and can transform uh, our lives like water into wine. And I just thought that is just the most beautiful imagery, but that's actually what we're asked to do, right? We're asked to do that. And I think we can also apply this as artists, as we fill our own water pots as artists and fill our wells, our creative wells, um, we too, can be transformed and hopefully our art can be transformed too. So my hope for you of, um, as artists, um, as you go forward um, and after you graduate and you no longer have religion classes and that you are now your own boss and nobody's telling you to go study the scriptures that you will choose that you will choose to keep following him. You will choose to stay close to the scriptures, that you will choose to make Christ the focus of your life and to let the Lord prevail in your life and in your art. I, and I hope that you will choose this and I hope that you will also weed out all this stuff, all the distractions on social media, if the social media, your social media feeds are full of junk, unfollow that stuff and fill it with the good stuff because there are good stuff. There's stuff uh, from our church leaders and from our scholars and lots of good things out there um, that you can fill your life with, fill your life with light so that as we, as we do this, we can not only bring others to Christ with our art, but I think we can bring ourselves along too. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Good evening, everyone. I, I'm really grateful for the invitation to join in celebrating uh, the winners of the Book of Mormon Art Contest and share a few thoughts about the importance of religious art. Uh, and it's really an honor uh, to share the program with the wonderful artist Rose Dahl uh, and, and with my friend and, and colleague Jenny Champeau, who's uh, done so much amazing work with the Book of Mormon Art Catalog. Um, as a small token of my own appreciation for Rose's work, I, I wanted to start by highlighting one of her paintings that I've especially admired, and it's the one she just showed us a little bit about uh, a, a moment ago, Anointing for Burial. This painting depicts the episode 
uh, in Mark 14, in which an unnamed woman anoints Jesus' head. And as Rose mentioned, there's a very similar story in John 12 of Mary, the sister of Lazarus, anointing Jesus' feet. Uh, and lots of ways that we could look at an image like this. Uh, for me, I really enjoy contemplating this painting through the lens of Mark's account, uh, which is set just before the events of Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection. In Mark, this woman is the first disciple who accepts Jesus' messianic mission as he has taught it. Earlier, Peter had confessed, you are the Christ. But then Jesus had told his disciples that his mission was to go to Jerusalem, suffer, and be put to death. And Peter objected to that and rebuked Jesus. That did not go well. Uh, Jesus told Peter, get behind me, Satan. Uh, and Peter and the other disciples continued to learn and struggle like we all do. Uh, but in Mark's gospel, it isn't until late in the story that we finally see this woman as the first disciple to indicate that she accepts Jesus' atoning mission. She communicates this not by word, but by deeds, by performing a symbolic act, by painting a picture, so to speak. She takes precious oil, very expensive ointment, and pours it on Jesus' head. Now, in ancient Israel, kings were anointed this way, and oil was also used to anoint the bodies of the dead before burial. Symbolically, she's saying, this is my king. This is the Messiah. This is the Christ. And he is about to die. Jesus says, she has anointed my body beforehand for its burial, interpreting this visual parable. So often the challenge of faith for all of us is to let Jesus be Jesus, to let God be God to say, thy will be done, even when it breaks our hearts. And this unnamed woman in Mark 14 models that kind of faith. Jesus praises her and says, wherever the gospel is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Now, I don't know about you, but I have rarely heard her story told. I don't think I've ever listened to a uh, a sacrament being taught that discussed her. Yet Rose's painting does what Jesus had asked. It tells the story of what this woman did in remembrance of her. It represents the imagery that this unnamed woman had used and invites us to remember. I love how Rose decided to use the amber color of olive oil. She has in effect immersed the scene in oil like the woman lavishly poured ointment over Jesus' head. Artists can bring our, to our attention episodes and people and details in Scripture that we've tended to overlook. And this can, uh, they can help us see with fresh eyes and new perspectives. They can enlarge our vision and our memory. And like poets and musicians who take up sacred subjects, they can help us consider Scripture more attentively and feel it more profoundly. We see this in what may be the earliest painting of Jesus in narrative art, a fragment of plaster depicting a ship holding a few disciples on a stormy sea and the figure of Jesus walking on the waves, reaching out to take the hand of Peter. This was painted around the year 240 in a small baptistry serving a little group of Christians in Syria. For those who were baptized in the font right next to the painting, the painting was a visual sermon, a reminder that Jesus Christ was the Lord of the water, the one who can calm storms, and that their own baptism in water was a life-saving moment, just as dramatic as the time when Peter cried out, Lord, save me, and Jesus pulled him up to safety. In this painting, and most of the earliest depictions of Jesus, artists depicted him beardless with short hair. They didn't know what he looked like uh, in life, of course, and uh, there was no description of his appearance in the Gospels, but that didn't matter to them. What they wanted to do was to communicate ideas about him, to retell Gospel stories about him, to bear testimony of him in visual art. It wasn't until the late fourth century that artists began depicting Jesus with longer hair and a beard, the portrait type that's a little more familiar to us. 
But once again, the intention wasn't to represent what Jesus looked like in his mortal life, but to depict him using visual vocabulary that would highlight his divinity. In Roman art, the senior gods of the Pantheon were typically shown with long hair and a beard, and Jupiter was seated on a throne. Adopting this mode of representation wasn't an attempt to say anything about uh, what Jesus looked like, but an effort to say something theological, to proclaim that Jesus wasn't only the carpenter from Nazareth, but also the Lord who watches over the whole world. The fourth century was a time when um, Christians were emphasizing these ideas in religious competition with traditional Roman religions. And this is one example of how the visual art of religious communities develops over time to meet changing needs and to express that community's shared convictions. We can trace developments in religious history by looking at a religious community's visual culture. And these are some of the reasons why the Book of Mormon Art Catalog and the Book of Mormon Art Contest are such exciting projects. Assembling the works of visual art produced by Latter-day Saints helps us see ourselves and our shared faith in the ways we are reading and visually representing the keystone scripture of the Restoration. Uh, when I joined the BYU faculty, I made sure that my Book of Mormon classes always included some study of Book of Mormon art. One of the discoveries my students and I made early on is that in our brief history, Latter-day Saints have already developed a recognizable iconography of Nephi, the stereotypical way of portraying him. Now, early representations of Nephi, such as these late 19th century paintings, portray him as sort of a nondescript, vaguely biblical kind of character. Uh, like the painting of Jesus walking on the water, the interest was less in Nephi as a character than in a scriptural narrative. But then in the 1950s, Arnold Freeberg produced his famous set of Book of Mormon paintings. Here, Nephi has dark wavy hair wrapped in a leather band, a rugged, clean shaven face. He looks like Steve Young, do you notice? And he wears a leather tunic slung over one shoulder and leather sandals. Since then, portrayals of Nephi have often adopted many, if not all, of these identifiers which have become sufficiently well-known that we can now make Nephi Halloween costumes. So, uh, the Book of Mormon art catalog has 750 entries under Nephi, and they actually reveal more diversity than this popular image. One of the valuable things that the art catalog is doing is collecting works depicting underrepresented persons and narratives. The rising attention to overlooked parts of the Book of Mormon uh, like Rose's painting uh, of the woman who anointed Jesus, I think reflects a growing attentiveness to the text and that very Latter-day Saint endeavor to turn our hearts to our fathers and mothers and to build Zion by being mindful of the least of these among us. Carly Smith's tooled leather work, Women Leading Us to Christ, depicts a procession of women mentioned in the Book of Mormon. From right to left, we see Eve, Mary, Sariah, Abish, the Lamanite queen, and one of the unnamed mothers of a stripling warrior. This simple piece of leather highlights women who don't figure prominently on gold plates. Art historian Thomas Matthews observed that ancient written sources seldom preserve the reflections of women, but perhaps what is lacking in literary sources has been made up in the visual sources. Now, he was talking about ancient Christian art, but I think Latter-day Saint artists are providing what Matthews described, the visual art joining scripture to give us a fuller picture. In Carly's work, I love how Abish is holding the queen's hand a visual echo of Alma 1929 when Abish went and took the queen by the hand to lift her up, to raise her up from her trance. And a beautiful symbol of Abish's devotion to her queen. Abish carries what seems to be a lantern, a subtle reminder that this disadvantaged Lamanite slave girl held personal divine knowledge that people around her lacked. And when she acted upon it at a key moment, she led the way and changed the course of Lamanite and Nephite history. We Latter-day Saints have not yet developed a single popular iconography of Abish. To judge from the diverse representations in the Book of Mormon art catalog, we are in a moment when artists are experimenting 
with a variety of ways of representing her status as a slave and her identity as an ancient Lamanite, while also highlighting her spiritual insight, her decisiveness, and her simple, courageous actions. Uh, I hope the diversity and experimentation continue. To me, they suggest that our people's religious imagination is fired up and at work, and I take that as a very good sign. God, the Creator, created us in the image of God. When we create, we are acting from that divine image within us. Japanese-American artist Makoto Fujimura says, to be human is to be creative. We would lose a great deal, he says, if we heard the good news delivered only as linear propositional information, for the gospel is a song. Or we might say the gospel is a painting, or a mosaic, or a poem. We need visual art, poetry, music, theater, film, not as mere accompaniments to scripture, but as inspired human creations in their own right, alongside scripture. All of these works joining together to, as Fujimura put it, sing back in response to the voice of eternity echoing through our broken lives. So on that note, I'll close with a quick scriptural thought. The first person in the Bible said to be filled with the Spirit of God is an artist named Bezalel. While the children of Israel are camped at Mount Sinai, the Lord says to Moses, I have called by name Bezalel, and I have filled him with the divine spirit, ability, intelligence, knowledge, and every kind of skill to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, and cutting stones, and carving wood, and every kind of craft. I've appointed with him Aholiab, and all the skillful, so that they may make the tent of meeting, and the ark of the covenant, and the cover that is on it, and all the furnishings of the tent. Bezalel and the other artists, filled with the Spirit of God, used their skills to create a tabernacle in the wilderness a dwelling place for the Lord's presence. That's what artists so often do, especially those who create religious art. They create works that, as we view them, listen to them, engage with them, contemplate them, draw us into an experience of wonder and realization, of imagination of the world and the cosmos in which the divine operates. Their works of art are small dwelling places for God's presence, like the tabernacle, a place where we encounter some aspect, some facet, some glimpse of the divine. It may be beautiful, inspiring. It may be troubling, provocative, or indicting. It will in some way reveal a truth and invite our engagement. Now, scripture does all these things too. But for us creatures who bear God's image, images are close kin, and they communicate in ways that pull us up out of our little box of logocentric linear propositional information, like Abish lifting up the queen, like Jesus pulling up Peter, up, up, into a world of wondrous new possibilities. I'm thankful for the artists who do such inspiring work of God's goodness and of the goodness of our neighbors and who bear God's image in them. I bear testimony in Jesus' name. Amen.